While she's doing that, I just want to tell you a little bit more about Chelsea if you haven't already um, had the opportunity to work with her. Chelsea, as I mentioned, has been a graduate assistant um, working with the Palmer for the past year. I've been so fortunate to have her working with me closely in the education department at the Palmer. And Chelsea is um, a student, a master's student in the School of Visual Arts and the Art Education Program, and also a dual program, right, with Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. And um, I'm sure Chelsea might tell you, but so excited for her that she's finished her program and all but done for the graduation date. So congratulations to that. You've been quite um, an asset to the museum and to me over the past year. And I appreciate that your work has been stellar and you've been working on this sort of women in art theme for um, even before we kind of went, went remote. So I'm so pleased that you're able to continue working with us this summer and bring us this talk. I'll go ahead and stop talking about you <laughs> at okay. this point so you can begin. I'm lo really looking forward to hearing, um, hearing what you are bringing to us today. Oh, thank you, Brandy. I really appreciate it. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, first of all, thank you everybody for coming. It's very strange because I can't see all of you, so I'm assuming that you're out there and I, you're, I'm imagining your beautiful smiling faces, but for me, I'm just speaking to a screen. Um, but thank you so much for coming. Uh, again, as Brandy said, I um, am a master's student in art education and women's and gender studies, um, but I am finished or almost finished. Um, and for this talk, I just selected just a couple works uh, that represent some pieces by women in the Palmer's collection. And I selected these specific works to talk to you today because they give us a glimpse into the many ways that women artists represent themselves um, in art and also challenge social conventions and expectations of gender through their art. Um, as Brandy mentioned, I've been working on a larger body of work about women in art and we'll be really excited to share that with you soon. So this is just a small, uh, just a little curated selection from the larger body of work we have by women at the Palmer Museum. But before Chelsea, as you get started too, I'm sorry to interrupt yes, you, go ahead. but um, I had said that I would do a little um, announcement at the beginning just to make yeah. sure we do assume that everybody in our audience is oh. adults. But in the event that we have families out there watching or who are watching together on the video, um, Chelsea, some of Chelsea's slides will feature art that features nudity. So it's nothing, um, you know, really new, but I wanted to let everybody know. Yeah. Sorry, but I didn't do that earlier. No, sure. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Nothing that you wouldn't see walking into, um, you know, a large museum type nudity, but good to mention just in case. Um, but as I was saying, these works um, are just a selection out of the larger body of work we've got at the museum by women artists. Uh, but before getting into the specifics, I just want to talk a little bit about the context of women in art. Um, this might be something that many of you are familiar with, but for anyone who's kind of coming to this new or new to art history, I think it's important to talk about the history of women in art and why it's important that we look specifically at women's artwork and consider it um, separate from other things. So women have been making powerful artwork throughout all of human existence, but unfortunately, the patriarchal structure of Western society has favored artwork by men and actively worked to exclude and erase women from art institutions and in art history. It's really only been since the mid 20th century that women artists have secured a solid place in museums, galleries, and art schools. However, even today, women, especially women of color, continue to face discrimination in the art world and continue to be underrepresented in museum collections and art history textbooks. According to research conducted by the American Museum of Women in the Arts, even though women make up 46% of visual artists working in the United States, just 11% of acquisitions made by prominent museums in the last decade represent female artists. Just 11%. Um, only 14% of exhibitions held at those museums were comprised of work by women. Data surveys of the 18 most prominent museums in the US reveal that of over 10,000 artists in these museums, 87% are male and 85% are white. Um, clearly, based off of these, these statistics, it's important that we still consider women's work and how we can create space for women, especially women of color, in museums. Uh, this lack of representation is largely due to historical maligning of women's form of, of expression. For example, we have this designation in art between high art and craft art. And this divide is somewhat arbitrary, at least in my opinion, um, because a lot of those materials or mediums that are considered craft work are associated with women, historically associated with women, and non-Western art forms. So weaving, sewing, quilting, ceramics, needlework, 
have all been devalued over time and seen as lesser than maybe the academic forms like uh, painting or uh, classical sculpture. Um, there have definitely been strides made towards appreciating these forms of art in contemporary art, yet looking back through time, we can still see that they are given a lower status and often separated from other artworks today in museums and art history textbooks. Um, additionally, women of the past were the women of the past who were able to break into the world of academic painting and sculpture were often lost to history because their work was not collected or archived properly by the male dominated worlds of art history, criticism and collecting. For most of history, women have been represented in museums as subject matter. The female nude is a common trope throughout art history that we'll be talking about today, uh, which depicts women's bodies as passive objects to be consumed and controlled by men. Up until the feminist art movement of the 1960s and 70s, the only artwork you really saw, for the most part, of women that depicted women were created by men, and depictions of women that were made by women were seen as very threatening, um, often crude or even pornographic to sort of the uh, dominant culture. Um, additionally, as I've mentioned, uh, women have been excluded from major art institutions, um, yet we see them all over the walls in the form of famous masterful works of art by men. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Here I have some examples of very famous works that depict women that were created by male artists. And I picked these artworks because uh, these to me are a great example of this concept of the male gaze, which I will also be talking about through the, out this talk. Um, works throughout art history which focus on the female body and, uh, and the female experience depict women through the male gaze. And the male gaze is a term that was coined by the film critic Laura Mulvey, which references the lens through which men view women and reflects that view onto culture. So throughout history, the male gaze has shaped the collective cultural identity of women through an objectifying and flattening depictions in art and media. For this talk, I chose the works that I'm going to be talking about, three works, um, because they all play into this concept of the male gaze and the historical representation of gender and art. In all of these works, the artists work within tropes of art history, uh, appropriating common poses, subject matter, and concepts, and turns them on their head to make a point about the political and social experiences of women. These works also point out the constructed nature of gender, in which certain attributes are assigned to individuals based on biology alone. You may notice that all the works that I'm gonna talk about are contemporary and were created since uh, or during the 1980s. This is partially by choice, just I gravitate, gravitate towards those works, but it also reflects the fact that we don't have a ton of examples of work in museums um, before this time. Of course, there are some examples, but there aren't nearly as many. And uh, I wanted to focus on that to kind of show how artists since the feminist art movement have played with these art historical representations to sort of challenge the history of art. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go through all of these works are relatively contemporary. And that will take us to the first one I want to talk about today, which is this piece, uh, which is, I think, a great place to start as we discuss gender and how it's portrayed through art history and also how feminist artists have used these conventions to critique the way women are treated in society. So this piece is called Self-Portrait as a Woman Recovering from the Effects of the Male Gaze, parentheses, what's underneath. And this is by the American artist, Julie Heffernan. Heffernan is known for her realistic, complex, surreal paintings. And this one is certainly no exception to her distinctive style. Um, this work has a lot going on and there's a lot to unpack conceptually. So I think it's good to start from the initial reading of how this work looks from a distance. Uh, and then once we go into a little deeper, we'll look more at sort of the details that are going on there. Um, from this view of this uh, slide I've got up, this might look a lot like a traditional still life painting. The style and rendering of the fruit is very realistic and stands in stark contrast to the dark surroundings. Uh, for those who are familiar with art, with art history, this general style and composition should look somewhat familiar this is centuries of traditional still life works, which depict bountiful fruit, bowls of fruit and flowers. Um, and even in our own collection at the Palmer, we can see a very popular example of this academic professional exercise in still life painting. And this work, of course, is by Severin Rosen um, and is on the first floor of the Palmer. And I think the comparison here is um, pretty noteworthy. Not that they are, you know, she's trying to copy this work specifically, but the style we can really see what she's borrowing from. Uh, in addition to the subject matter, I think it's also worth noting the large scale of this work. Uh, this painting is nearly 68 by 68 inches, which is over five and a half feet each way. Uh, this certainly adds to the sort of bold, 
uh, grandiose quality of this work and further draws that connection to these old master works that were you know, very large and imposing. Um, now that we've sort of looked at the work as a whole, we can get into some of the details and there are a ton of details in this work. Uh, when we take a closer look, we can begin to see them and, and sort of pick out what she might be trying to say with all of these little vignettes. Um, looking at this detail, you may notice that there are some miniature paintings embedded within the fruit. Um, at the top of the painting, there's the scrolling text. Um, also, you might notice the sort of mysterious graphic elements of the bullseye or the watermark that is laying across the entire composition. These elements convey, at least to me, that there's a lot of complexity to this work. And of course, it goes much farther than just a simple arrangement of fruit. So to get into the many potential interpretations of this work, I think we should first talk about the title. Again, the title is Self-Portrait of a Woman Recovering from Effects of the Male Gaze, parentheses, what's underneath. And most of Heffernan's work depicts the artist in some way. Most of her works are some form of a self-portrait, but most other ones are a lot more literal. This is, I would consider, a very conceptual self-portrait. Um, if we look at it this way, we might see this portrait as a fragmented, as her reflecting her fragmented identity as a woman through the lens of modern society. As I've mentioned, the term male gaze comes up frequently in feminist discussions of art and references the historical use of women as subjects in artworks. Um, women seen through the male gaze are sexual objects with little substance beyond their physical beauty. The use of the male gaze throughout Western art traditions has contributed to the flattening of women's identities and prevalent understanding of women as consumable and pass passive. I think the connection here with the fruit makes a lot of sense, just like women's use of subject matter in historical paintings, fruit also were subject matter that was just kind of discarded uh, when it was no longer useful or when it was rotting. Um, and I think she, I personally, I think she's drawing a comparison with the use of women um, as subjects and potentially the use of fruit as well. Um, let's catch up on my notes here. So I think that this work is really dealing with her conception of the male gaze and how she can see herself as an object through the male gaze, through this conditioning over time. Um, to get into some of the little vignettes here, there's a lot to look at, but she's definitely allusion to alternative histories. We see some little, um, some little scenes in there, which maybe to me look like maybe early American style paintings or, or alternate mythologies. They're kind of surreal and um, very much left up to the viewer to, to see. There's also uh, references to mid-century advertisements. There's a woman examining herself in the mirror. And um, in many instances, the fruit seems to almost morph um, into breasts and genitalia. So she's just really um, playing with a lot of ideas in this large work. Uh, another detail slide here, that shows some of that text on the top. Unfortunately, it's probably too small to read, but um, that, that handwritten text at the top alludes to Venus, the Roma, Roman goddess of love and beauty. And the text describes Venus much differently than most depictions we would be familiar with. Um, here, Venus is, quote, sitting on a dog chain, Venus cracking peanuts with her teeth, shells piling up around her belly, Venus making bad jokes, hoping for a laugh, Venus trying to make nice to hear her own voice speak, end quote. Here, Venus is challenging prevalent images of women and beauty. In this poem, Venus is revealed as painfully and perversely human, far from the romanticized vision she's come to represent in art history and mythology. So much like women have been portrayed as these sort of perfect flattened goddesses, here she's adding all of this dynamic, very human elements to our vision of Venus. Further, the bullseye pattern, which is overlaid, um, obscures the image in some ways. And like much of this work, I think is left up to interpretation. I I've initially saw it as a reference to hypnotic swirling patterns that leave you dizzy and disoriented. Um, I think Brandy at one time mentioned to me that she uh, saw it more as a watermark to uh, resist image and identity appropriation. I think that's very much up to you how you wanna see that, but I love that there are so many different ways to read this work. Um, I think this work is so compelling and complicated and I wish that we could have a discussion about it. It's a shame that this is such a one way thing because I, every time I talk to people about this, I have new insight into this work after hearing their uh, interpretation. So if you are thinking of something or you see something within this work you wanna share, please hold on to it and share it during the Q&A because I would love to hear what you're thinking. 
Uh, the next piece I want to talk about, oh, there it is again, <laughs> one last view for us before I move on. The next piece I want to talk about is one of my favorites in the Palmer's collection. And I think it would be pretty difficult to give a talk about works by um, women and that discuss gender uh, without discussing this piece by Judy Chicago. It's titled Three Faces of Man, and it's from the series Power Play. And it was created in 1985, and as I will discuss later, is still very relevant today as it was when she created it. Um, for anyone who is unfamiliar, Judy Chicago is one of the most well-known uh, American feminist artists of the 20th century. And she was like the first class of female artists who came into prominence during the 1960s and 70s during the feminist art movement. So she's kind of considered a, a pioneering trailblazer for feminist art. And I love her look, she's so cool. Um, I, one of the things I really love about Judy Chicago is she's a pioneering art educator. She was responsible for founding the first uh, American art program dedicated to female artists at Fresno State University in 1970. Um, up until then, women had been largely excluded from art institutions, and those who were able to attend art school were very much uh, asked to adhere to a strict male aesthetic, which is something that Judy Chicago experienced and she pushed against in a very big way. Uh, on the right here is just an example of probably her most iconic work, The Dinner Party, and it is considered one of the most foundational works by feminist artists ever created. It is massive. It's at the Brooklyn Museum. It's a huge uh, dinner party setup with each placemat representing a different uh, important woman throughout history and mythology. So if you are unfamiliar with that work, I highly recommend diving in. The Brooklyn Museum has an amazing website where they show each individual place. You'll lose yourself for hours. Go for it. It's really fun. But uh, <laughs> gotta get us back to what I was talking about, which is um, Chicago's education really fueled her feminist fire and her desire to uh, turn her artwork into a means for political change. So uh, as an art student in college, Chicago felt very constrained by the deeply misogynistic art world. Uh, her work, she was fortunate enough to go to art school, but her work was only accepted by her teachers when she attempted to paint from a male perspective and using a male aesthetic. So that often meant using a lot of geometric shapes, uh, a lot of bold contrasting colors, and any work that sort of even abstractly referenced the female form was seen as very inappropriate. Um, Chicago was very fed up with her limited role. She was forced to play. And so she's spent her career since then pushing against rigid boundaries of what makes something legitimate art. And so Chicago is, work is not limited to any one medium. Uh, she's really pushed against this, against this idea of craft art to, and, and really become an expert in many different styles like embroidery, quilting, ceramics, and airbrushing. In the attempt to elevate those mediums um, from sort of craft, low art to high art and, and make women's work uh, on the same level of these other academic approaches. Uh, this specific work that I'm talking about, The Three Faces of Man, comes from a much larger body of work that she created called Power Play. And this was created all in the mid-1980s. And during this period of Chicago's career, she chose to turn the lens around and observe masculinity. Uh, up until this point, a lot of feminist artwork was very importantly focusing on femininity, but the ubiquitousness of masculinity and male culture meant that it, not many people were thinking about masculinity as something of its of its own. It's kind of similar to the way we're thinking about whiteness now. Um, it's so ubiquitous, people weren't realizing that it's something to be studied on its own. And so this is a similar thing where Chicago is looking at masculinity and studying masculinity. Um, and this work deals a lot with male emotion and how masculinity fluctuates between aggressive self-assertion, fear, and vulnerability. And power play is uh, about the demands that patriarchy places on men and examines how men kill off their more female coded qualities of compassion and understanding to adhere to this cultural uh, requirement. So for the three faces of man, oh, let me go back to my previous slide so we can look at it. This, this particular piece um, draws on act academic exercises made popular during the 18th and 19th century called Teste de Expression. Um, in which artists attempted to convey a range of emotions through facial expressions. So Chicago restricts the strict limitations placed on her as a woman by juxtaposing traditional art making techniques with non-traditional representations of male emotion. In doing so, she comments on the constructed nature of gender in which particular attributes are forced onto in individuals based on their biological sex alone. This work highlights the narrow expression, narrow emotions society allows men to inhabit 
and reflects how repressed emotion manifests in sometimes violent or outburst, outburst in kind of ways. So some of you, especially those of you who, have, who are you know, dedicated Palmer members, will remember that this work recently emerged into public consciousness again when Chicago posted, um, right here, oh, there we go. When Chicago uh, posted this series of paintings next to images of um, different politicians during the emotional testimonies surrounding past sexual assault claims against uh, Brett Kavanaugh during his nomination hearings for the Supreme Court. Uh, in this Instagram post, Chicago compared this work to the three images of the male politicians and commented on how relevant the topic continues to be 35 years after this work was initially put into view. Uh, I think at this moment in political history, it's especially important for us to consider um, the conventions of masculinity and how patriarchy he negatively impacts men as well as women. Um, I wonder, as you look at these works, how you would describe the role of male emotion in mainstream American culture. Uh, unfortunately, I can't take questions right now, but if we do at the end have time, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, which emotions are men allowed to project? Which emotions are forbidden? And um, again, please, I'd be curious to start a discussion if we have time at the end during our uh, Q&A. So this is uh, the power play piece, and I will move on to my last one, hopefully with enough time left to spare. Um, uh, this piece is by Faith Ringhold. I love this piece. I think it's absolutely beautiful. And um, it's titled Joe Baker's Birthday. And I have to say, I fell in love with this piece last year. I um, was in a class that was at the Palmer, and we looked at this work. And I am kind of embarrassed to say that I was not familiar with Faith, Faith Ringhold's work before seeing this piece. And that might just be a sort of gap in my knowledge, but I also think it speaks to how little black women and women of color's work is taught um, in schools. I have a minor in art history uh, and unfortunately never came across her work even during those four years of study. And I think that is worth noting that um, Ringold is an amazing, incredible artist. And if, you're, if you like this work, I would really recommend diving into her larger body of work. She does these amazing quilts. Uh, she has uh, several children's books. She's just a really fantastic artist. So if you aren't familiar like I was, please look farther into her, um, her career. But that being said, to talk more about this piece specifically, um, Faith Ringhold, she's a contemporary artist best known for her narrative quilts, which often revisit prominent figures in African-American history. And um, this work is in the Palmer's collection. It is a print which was made off of an original quilt square by Ringhold. And it is part of a series of works called 10 by 10 Women, 10 Prints. Um, I'm sorry, 10 by 10, 10 Women, 10 Prints. And it's a series of 10 prints all by um, feminist artists that the, the Palmer has the full collection of. And it's a beautiful series. Uh, all of the artists in it are fantastic. So again, another wonderful gem in our collection uh, that's worth appreciating. Um, in this particular work, we see an image of a beautiful woman reclining on a chaise lounge. She appears relaxed and comfortable. Um, and in the next room, we see a white woman preparing food for her. The title of the work, Joe Baker's Birthday, gives us a little hint into the meaning of this work. Josephine Baker was an American born dancer who became famous in France uh, as an erotic dancer of the jazz age. Sorry, my dog is barking in the background. I hope that's not <laughs> getting in the way. Um, so here is Josephine Baker. Um, I believe these were from her performances in France. And uh, despite the fact that Baker was a, a tremendous success um, and you know, wildly famous, uh, she was kind of forced to rely on, um, her, her career is very much in, tied to racist attitudes and misrepresentation. Um, so in order to succeed as a performer, Baker was forced to buy into racial stereotypes of the time. Uh, this was exemplified in the, her most popular act, which was called Danse Sauvage. Um, I, believe, I believe that translates to the Dance of the Savage. And um, in this performance, she performed nearly nude with a skirt made of, of a string of artificial bananas. And you can see that on the image on the left. Um, this dance relied on racist stereotypes, uh, which associated people of African descent with primitive and savage behavior. So, um, you know, from our standpoint now, we can see that this is a very um, offensive uh, depiction, but for her as a black woman trying to succeed in entertainment, uh, this is the avenue she needed to go down to have any kind of a claim or recognition. Um, she is 
so cool though because after get, gaining this fame and this level of privilege she really asserted it in wonderful ways so she herself became a prominent and fiercely independent african-american woman and um was extremely dynamic smart and cunning and she was one of the most highly paid dancers in the world at her time and one of my favorite little tidbits about her is later during world war ii baker even served as a french resistance spy she used her status in society as an entertainer to gather and transmit information to England. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, Baker herself is just a fascinating character, but for the interest of time, I'll return back to the work. Um, so in this piece, Faith Ringhold imagines a day in the life of this iconic woman. Ringhold places Baker at the center of a sumptuous and comfortable space. Her outstretched arms and spread legs indicate total relaxation. Her pose deliberately references um, this kind of tradition of the reclining female nude that we've talked about and is certainly in some ways a reference to the iconic work Olympia by Edward Menet from 1863. Um, again, returning to this idea of the male gaze, Olympia here is uh, a reclining female nude and it's kind of come to epitomize the use of women as artistic subjects throughout Western art history. Um, by selecting this pose, Ringhold is deliberately referencing not only the delegation of women to subject matter, as well as the exclusion of black women and women of color from the erotic imagination of a white dominated society. Um, and behind, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this one, okay. So in behind this, um, the reclining, beautiful jo Josephine Baker, we also see a white woman who's preparing food for her. And this is another, this ties into this whole conceptual idea. This um, image directly re references Henry Matisse's work, Harmony in Red, uh, right here. And this, adding this element further positions Baker as a symbol of black female power. As she casually lounges, um, she's being waited on by a white maid which stands in direct contrast to Olympia and the servant which presents Olympia Flowers, who is a black woman. Uh, this quilt square is reimagining history uh, in which Baker is living out her earned leisure while also challenging social conventions and highlighting gender and racial inequality. Now, this is just one square out of a much larger quilt uh, that Ringhold created, uh, which features a fictional character named Willa. And in this story that's played out through this large quilt, Willa encounters important European artists, as well as influential African-American women. And so this is throughout all of these quilt squares, squares this is just juxtaposition, excuse me, of um, uh, famous works of Western art juxtaposed with these reimagined histories of African-American women. And uh, in this work, she, she says that she's seeking to redress the absence of these women in historical narratives. And I think I read somewhere um, that she chose this selection because her character Willa, this combination of, of Matisse and Ringhold, because Willa, this, this little girl who is in this story, uh, thought that Faith Ringhold would really like this painting. And I thought that was kind of a sweet uh, little tidbit. So uh, Ringhold very deliberately uses quilts as her primary medium. And uh, this is because, as we've kind of talked about before, quilting has been historically discounted um, and not considered a serious artistic medium because of its association with women's work. So many feminist artists like Ringhold have worked with fabric and quilting techniques to contest the misrepresentation um, and highlight the skill, craftsmanship, and historical importance of quilting. Further, it's worth noting that Ringhold has spoken about the importance of quilting in African-American history and storytelling. And um, as many of you I'm sure know, quilts were used during the Underground Railroad to covertly give directions to slaves fleeing slavery and seeking freedom, enslaved people fleeing slavery. Um, Ringold harnessed both histories to create native uh, narrative quilts, which highlight the contributions of Black women across time, which I think is just a beautiful and amazing uh, way of reimagining these histories. So with that, uh, I will leave you. I know it's a lot of information, but I really appreciate all of you coming and spending this Friday afternoon with me. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I hope that we can sort of continue the conversation in the Q&A. Uh, before we do that, I do want to just mention that if you enjoyed this talk, you might want to uh, stay tuned for our upcoming virtual tour, which uh, I've been working on and the education team has been working on. And this is going to be a very large, um, many works included that are all works by women in the museum. And you'll be able to virtually navigate through and uh, see all of the amazing stuff we've got going on. So with that, I will hand it over to Brandy. Thank you, Chelsea. 
It was wonderful. I learned a lot. And we do have a comment in our Q&A more than a question. It says, I learned a lot. Thanks. So oh, good. I agree with that. I did too. <laughs> you know, um, so it was a great presentation. If there is anybody who has a question or would like to comment further, I will be happy to, you know, activate your audio and let you participate. Chelsea, do you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen? Oh, so sure. You can be a little bigger. Great. Thanks. All right. Anybody? No? All right. Well, that was wonderful. And I'm glad that Chelsea did mention the upcoming virtual tour. Oh, there is a hand raised. Let me see. Um, Mary? I have activated Mary's ability to talk. You're, you're there. You can unmute yourself and ask your question or contribute. Mary, if you can hear me, you're still muted. I've Okay, oh, I should be. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank Mary. you so much. Such a great talk. I learned so much, and I I thought I knew a lot to begin with. I had the the. It was so exciting. Uh, Judy Chicago came to Penn State. I think it was in 2017, and um, I, I wasn't aware of the Faith Ringel work. So I can't wait to see it in person someday. Are there any other um, uh, artists you'd point out? From the Palmer collection or just in yeah, general? Yeah. Um, it's well, a Palmer, Palmer. I love your question. That's a great question. So this virtual tour that we're working on that should be available um, by the fall, beginning of the fall semester is going to have at least many of my favorite works by women in the collection and is a much more expansive look. So there are several other works from that 10 by 10 series, which I just love. Um, and you can also look those up online because um, there are collections that other museums have purchased as well. But we'll, uh, we'll dive into several of those. Um, a couple more works that are sort of in that same vein of the Heffernan and the Chicago. Um, we've got uh, Cindy Sherman we'll be talking about, uh, Kara Walker. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for that. And then also, you know, when we are able to visit the museum again, um, you'll be able to see that Heffernan and Chicago in person. If you, I'm guessing you have already, but they're very striking yeah. in person. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks for participating, Mary. I have another question. I'm going to bring in Darlene Clark. Um, there we go. Darlene, you should be active. If you can unmute, you can ask your question. Hi, thank you. That was really great. Um, yeah. I was wondering with the first painting with a focus on fruit, whether there was any possible connection, any discussion ever made with fruit of the womb. You know, mm. women bear children, they call it fruit of the a womb. Is that something that you've ever heard before? Well, this is exactly what I'm talking about. I love that you brought that up because no, I mean, I haven't thought of that before, but I think that's an amazing connection. Um, one of the things that I immediately thought of when you said that is that many, a lot of the fruit in that there are certain moments where at a certain angle, it kind of looks like a breast or maybe a, a vulva or something like that. It's like unclear. And so I think, I think it's very possible that she was referencing that. Um, one of the things that I think is, wonderful about this work but also intimidating is there are so many different interpretations and I think that they're all valid so I love that and we'll certainly integrate that in the future when I talk about this work. Well that's why things like this are so great. Um, yeah. More than one way to look at anything. Yeah thank you. Thank you. Oh Brandy you're muted. Okay. Thank you. I see we have another question coming in. Um, Erin asks, would you like to ask your question yourself, Erin? If so, I will put you, um, I will activate your audio. Erin's um, question is, and the comment is great job. Can you please elaborate on the use or appropriation of art historical references in these works that resist patriar patriarchal structures? Sure. So in feminist art, it's very common to um, play with images from art history or media depictions. Um, this idea of like, remixing is really popular in feminist art. So uh, I picked these works because in some ways I think that they all do that, but there are so many examples of this throughout feminist art. And I think it's, um, I'm sure there are lots of people that have written about why that is. To me, it, I, I see it as, um, 
symbols that were once used to oppress women or depict women in a very specific way and using those as a tool to highlight um, the structural political nature of many of these systems. So in the works that I talked about today, um, the Heffernan, the fruit piece, I think that the use of that style of uh, the still life is a very much a comment on the academic history of painting. Um, and to me, I see that uh, a connection that I've made is just this idea that the, the fruit is only um, helpful or beneficial while it's being painted and afterwards it's discarded. Uh, because it's rotting and it's um, it's really just appreciated for its beauty. So in that piece, that's how I would see that. She's also bringing in a lot of very small details that reference like advertisements and, and different things like that. So that's very much a collage of different appropriated images. Um, the Judy Chicago one maybe is a little bit more, um, less literal in her appropriation of imagery. Uh, she does use this academic uh, portraiture style where they were um, as, as an exercise for students, they would try to depict different facial expressions. Um, so she's certainly pulling off of that tradition to turn it on its head and, and focus on male emotion, which um, has not been largely investigated um, within art in that way. Um, but that piece, you know, the imagery itself isn't necessarily pulling from art historical traditions as much, but the sort of format is. Um, and then the Ringhold piece, I think, is um, maybe the mo most explicit uh, use of imagery with the Henry Matisse piece being spliced in there. Um, it's almost like a, it's basically a direct pull from that work. And I think that juxtaposition is powerful. So to juxtapose this image of this white woman that had a totally different context when Henry Matisse painted it, uh, contrasting it with this lounging, uh, luxurious black woman changes the entire way we look at that work. Um, that work was not necessarily about race, Henry Matisse's version, but now when it's juxtaposed with this, it, it adds all kinds of new meaning. Um, it might change the way we look at Henry Matisse's career or the time period that he made that work in this new context. So I don't know if that it was what you were asking, but I hope that kind of touched on it. Oh, you're muted still, Brandy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, during your answer to that, you answered someone else's question as well, but um, we have had a request. If you could please spell that term you're using, the Judy Chicago, is that sort of what they yes. were doing? Yeah. I would be happy to do that. Um, this is something that I learned from uh, the curator jo Joyce, our curator, and um, I was not, I think this is an older technique. Um, let me find it in my notes here, hold on. So this was a popular technique in the 18th and 19th century, and I have it as a uh, it's teste, which is like T-E-S-T-E, -E -E, de expression. This is my, how I pronounce it. And it's D apostrophe E-X-P-R-E-S-S-I-O-N. -S -S and that's an Italian term, is that correct? I believe so. All right, thank you. All right, great conversation here. Anyone else want to participate or have a question? My dog wants to participate. He's right here. <laughs> <laughs> the land of the pets. All right, I think at this point we've covered, oh wait, there is another question. Um, I'm going to go ahead and activate your audio if that's all right. We have Carrie, who has a question. Are you unmuted to participate? Yeah. Yes, Hi, Chelsea, thanks so much for this. And um, going back to kind of the previous question about um, the appropriation of different art historical motifs, I'm thinking about the Heffernan and particularly in the format of still life, um, which back in the French Academy was kind of the lowest genre of painting mm -hmm. that, um, because it didn't require any kind of mod model study. Um, and women were not allowed into the academy. So a lot of women artists at the time were painting things like still lives because it was accessible to them. So I'm also wondering too, if you've seen anything in the uh, literature that you've read on that work by Heffernan, if it's possibly to, um, by making the still life also so large, much larger than other still lives, if there's some kind of conversation happening there with um, kind of the historic subjugation of women and limitations placed on them as, as women artists and kind of reclaiming that through making this really like huge uh, still life painting. 
I love that perspective, Carrie. Thank you for sharing that info because I didn't know that specific history of um, still lifes as sort of the lowest form within the academy. So, I mean, kind of as uh, piggybacking off of what Mary and I talked about, which is just that, like, I think I think all of these interpretations are valid. I think that this work is left so open ended for interpretation, which is some of the the beauty in it that just in this conversation, I have two totally new um, perspectives on what this work might mean. Um, I don't, I can't speak specifically if like, I, I, I don't know if that's something that she was working for, but I think that adds a whole nother dimension to this is, is women artists sort of being scrappy and, uh, you know, making do with what they could. And it, it certainly reflects the perseverance of women artists. I think one thing that's, I find very frustrating um, when we look at, the history of women in art is that there's kind of a conception that just women didn't make art before a certain period of time. And that's just simply not true. It just wasn't preserved. Um, I saw an amazing talk with G Chicago about, uh, from G Chicago about like the uh, academic um, archival of women's artwork and how there have been moments in history when uh, there were very, very famous uh, groups of women artists that were well revered and, and lo loved uh, in France and their work just wasn't preserved. So we just don't know about it anymore. Um, and so I'm kind of on a tangent here, but my point being, I think that what your point brings up is that women have been making art for a very long time and we just need to remember that it, that it existed, even if we don't have that many examples of it. Right. I think that's a, maybe a great final note too, to send us off and kind of encapsulate where we are. I really love the additional comments and thoughts. I think that all of your questions really brought in, like you said, Chelsea, much more depth and complexity to these works. Really everybody's um, unique or, you know, the individual information that you bring in or questions you raise definitely add to it and add to our knowledge and understanding um, and appreciation of the work. So it was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank um, you. There are a few other thank yous in the comments. So great job, Chelsea. And um, I'm going to go ahead and say that we're coming to a close. And again, thank everybody for joining you, for joining us and um, enjoying the talk. And again, look for it, promote it. Um, when the video is on our YouTube channel, you can watch it again. Great. Thank you all. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>